Welcome to our latest Coffee Break webinar. The topic for today is uh, microplastics, more specifically the ban on microplastics. We'll start off with an uh, introduction, uh, like what are microplastics? We then move on to legislation. Uh, we start the timeline of the first couple of years and what we can expect. Uh, after that, we have some remarks and thoughts uh, to conclude uh, questions and how to contact us. So let's start. Microplastics, uh, what are we talking about? What's the big deal? Uh, what's the issue? And how do we get from microplastics to a legal restriction? Well, when we say microplastics and we talk about that, we think about microscopic scale of particles. Like uh, for this instance, uh, this is a person's finger uh, with on that finger um, all kinds of small partic particulates of uh, uh, microplastics, of plastics. So I think we can all agree that these are microplastics, but are these microplastics? Are these particles microscopic? Um, if you want to know what this specifically is, these are nurdles, and this is how uh, certain types of plastic are being delivered uh, to industrial sites or to uh, companies that uh, use this in uh, compounding, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Where did these microscopic plastic particles come from? Well, they can be intentionally added uh, to products, uh, let's say for exfoliating creams uh, or for uh, to acquire some extra abrasion and detergents and cleaning products. As of 2020, there have been some incentives uh, in the cosmetic and detergent industry to reduce the use of these substances. We also have unintentional release. Uh, like with washing and drying of synthetic uh, fibers in clothing, uh, but also uh, particulates that are being released through, due to uh, friction in uh, tires uh, for cars and uh, trucks. And the thing here is unintentionally or intentionally. We'll get to that a bit later on. The next thing that releases uh, microplastics is uh, the plastic waste. There is already uh, a great amount of, uh, of plastics uh, available in the environment. Um, let's say like uh, the Great Pacific uh, Garbage Patch, uh, which is actually just a very large number of plastic objects that are uh, floating in the ocean uh, that grind uh, against each other. Um, also, uh, the influence from the environment like uh, UV radiation, uh, frost, these are all things that add to the degradation uh, of plastic and the generation of uh, small uh, plastic particulates. One thing to keep in mind is all plastics are polymers, but not all polymers are plastics or microplastics. Now, what's the problem? These particulates are released in the environment. That can be through accidental release uh, by uh, shipping containers that go missing at sea uh, with loss of uh, um, nurdles or uh, other plastics uh, that uh, fall in the water. Uh, but also wastewater treatment uh, will not always be able to remove all the particulates that are present. These particulates can enter in the food chain. Um, this suppose these particles make it out to sea. Uh, these particulates get eaten by a small organism, like uh, let's say plankton, uh, that gets eaten by a small fish. Small fish get, uh, gets eaten by a bigger fish. Uh, we catch and eat that larger fish, and including all those particulates that uh, can be present. And uh, this way, it actually makes uh, its way into our body. But we can also uh, inhale particulates, uh, let's say through um, through gar uh, grinding uh, of uh, substances that are uh, that 
contain plastics. These can potentially bioaccumulate in our bodies. Bioaccumulation, people that have uh, already had some contact with SDSs know that there is a, a specific part that discusses PBTs and VPVBs, or persistent bioaccumulating and toxic, and very persistent and very bioaccumulative uh, traits. Microplastics are not as innocent as we first thought. Not only is it the, the small scale of the plastic in itself, so not just the polymer, but also the additives, uh, plasticizers, flame retardants, all kinds of uh, substances that we add to improve um, the char characteristics uh, of the plastic. We are learning more and more about these additives and we are starting to understand the impact on our health. We also know that there are studies uh, that were conducted that prove that there are uh, allergic reactions in uh, humans at even a cellular level. So we can say that there is a connection between microplastics and uh, the impact on health and environment. Legislation. What does the law have to say about this? Well, we know that there is an impact on the environment and on uh, our health. Now, the Euro European Commission has something to say about that, uh, which can, in this, uh, in this uh, example, be a very good thing. Opposed to having national restrictions, which could lead up to a patchwork of laws and regulations, there is now a European legislation, a sort of an uh, umbrella concept uh, that covers all uh, European nations. So instead of checking, uh, I want to export to Germany or I want to go to, uh, um, to France, uh, and every country would uh, be having its own uh, specific uh, law or legislation, you would have to check all those regulations to see in which countries you can uh, you can sell your product or not, uh, because there would be uh, certain differences. Now, the Euro European Commission has been working on the Euro European Green Deal uh, and the Circular Economy Pact. Uh, there is also the Zero Pollution Action Plan. And the idea of all these legislations is to say, well, the we want to reduce uh, uh, pollution uh, by 2030 by 30%. The full extent of the timeline would prevent a potential, uh, potential release of 500,000 metric tons of microplastics being released for in the next couple of 20 years. This leads to the Commission regulation, uh, also known, uh, known as the dreaded ban on microplastics. So what does the le legislation have to say about this? Well, synthetic polymer microparticles shall not be placed on the market as substances on their own or where, uh, where the synthetic polymer microplastics are present to confer a salt after characteristic in mixtures in a concentration equal to or greater than 0.01% by weight. What this means is, like I said before, the intentional character um, of the uh, added microplastic. Uh, do I add this for a specific reason for sought after uh, characteristic, like for instance, uh, the abrasiveness, uh, then it is intentional and then I have to see this as a microplastic. If it's not, if it's something that um, is completely detached from the characteristic I'm looking for, it's not an intentionally added microplastic uh, and it can be uh, uh, limited. Well, what kind of uh, uh, microplastics uh, can we think of? Well, like loose glitter, uh, detergents, cosmetics containing microbeads, uh, infill material for artificial sports fields. Uh, all these uh, things are in the scope uh, for the uh, synthetic polymer microparticles. The legal definition for microplastics, there are synthetic polymer particles, so polymers that are solid, uh, which both fulfill uh, the following conditions. A, they are particles, at least 1% by weight of those particles, 
uh, or they build a continuous surface coating on those particles. B, at least 1% by weight of the particles is refer uh, referred to. Uh, all dimensions of the particle are equally or smaller than five millimeters, uh, like when you take a nurdle or a, a, a spherical uh, uh, particle, uh, and all I demand, uh, all in all dimensions, uh, it will be smaller or equal to five millimeters. Or for length of particles, there's a length to diameter ratio uh, larger than three. I'll give you a small example. Let's take a rod or a fiber that's 15 millimeters long and four millimeters wide. Then you can uh, calculate the ratio uh, and you get a ratio of 3.75, which is larger than three and would make this a microplastic. Let's take that same fiber, but uh, now it will be 12 millimeters long and five millimeters wide. And would get a ratio of 2.4, which is smaller than three and not a microplastic. I took this, uh, these uh, examples uh, deliberately to show you uh, how close you get um, to those ratios and to uh, the, uh, the view of it. it's a microplastic or not a microplastic. Now, there are certain cases uh, that are excluded from the designation microplastic. And it is polymers that are a result of polymerization that occurs in nature. So it's independent from the process in which it's being extracted, um, as long as you don't chemically modify these substances. Uh, natural polymers uh, can be DNA uh, or, for example, uh, wood which brings us to cellulose. Cellulose is a natural polymer. Polymers that are biodegradable, um, there are specific rules uh, to see if a certain polymer is biodegradable, and that's described in Annex 15 uh, of the same uh, regulation. For instance, PVA or polyvinyl alcohol. The next thing is uh, solubility. If you can prove that the polymers have a solubility, solubility larger than two grams per liter, uh, you can uh, exclude them from the definition of microplastics. We can use the same example here, uh, PVA, polyvinyl alcohol. The next one is an interesting one. Uh, I'll have to admit that. Um, I have an example here, which is still under evaluation um, because I wanted to talk about silicon. Why do I say under evaluation? Well, the skeletal structure of this polymer doesn't contain any C atoms, any carbon atoms, but the side groups and terminal groups could actually have uh, carbon atoms uh, in them. As a definition is for uh, the chemical structure of the polymer, the question remains if silicon is actually seen as a uh, uh, non-carbon containing uh, polymer. The legal definition of microplastic, uh, the regulation shall not apply to certain products like in placing on the market of, uh, well, A, microplastics that are used in industrial sites. Uh, let's say, uh, let's take the example of those nurdles uh, as long as it's the intention to make certain articles or different mixtures with these, um, then if only used for the industrial side, uh, it's uh, exempt from the uh, regulation. Second is medicinal products and uh, veter veterinary uh, medicinal products, EU fertilizers, food additives, uh, and vitro diagnostic devices and food and feed products within the scope of their specific uh, European regulations. Uh, example uh, that's uh, named here, all uh, have their uh, own regulations uh, to which they must abide. The regulation shall also not apply to microplastics, which are contained by technical means. And what I mean by technical means are like uh, printer toners, uh, water filtering cartridges, 
Uh, these are all examples where there are, could be micro uh, microplastics present, but uh, that are not easily uh, released uh, upon the normal use. Microplastics, which physical, uh, which have their physical properties permanently, uh, permanently modified during intended use uh, by fill forming, film forming, or swelling, uh, for example, diapers or nail polish. Synthetic polymer microparticles, uh, which are permanently incorporated in a solid matrix. Um, pellets that are used as a feedstock for uh, molded articles or fibers that are added to concrete uh, to strengthen their structures. Um, those are not expected to be released uh, during their intended use. So let's go take a look at a timeline. Well, first off, the reg uh, regulation was published on the 25th of September, 2023. And uh, the reg regulation went into effect on October 17th. Um, and there are certain dates and um, specific products that are named in the regulation. For instance, uh, suppliers uh, that supply microplastics to industrial sites, um, as of uh, October 17th of uh, 2025, they will have to uh, um, distribute information in the supply chain. This information will be instructions for use uh, and disposal uh, explaining to their industrial downstream users how to prevent the release of uh, microplastic. They will also need to make a statement uh, that a, a synthetic polymer microparticle particle, uh, supplied is subject to the conditions laid down by the entry 78 of Annex 17 to the regulation. There has to be information on quantity or concentration of microplastic in the substance or the mixture and also a general identification of the polymers used that enable uh, manufacturers or industrial downstream users and other suppliers to comply with their obligations. There is a thing that you could use to com uh, combine all this information, which is the safety data sheet. Next up, same date, uh, suppliers of food additives. They will also have to give instructions for use and disposal, uh, explain it to professional users and general public how to prevent the release of synthetic polymer microparticles to the environment. Again, the safety data sheet, but since uh, general public doesn't have access to a safety data sheet, uh, perhaps it would be uh, an idea to use uh, the label or uh, a sort of a leaflet that is uh, accompanying uh, the product. Manufacturers and industrial downstream users. As of 2026, they should start registering to ECHA. On the 31st of May of each year, they would have to uh, uh, register a description for the use of the synthetic polymer microparticles for the previous calendar year. Uh, for each use of the polymer, uh, generic information about the identity and also an estimate of the quantity of microplastics that are released in the environment uh, in the previous calendar year. And that is including transport. Um, if you know that uh, a big bag of noodles has a rupture during transport uh, on a truck uh, and you lost 100 uh, kilograms uh, of microplastics, or when you know that uh, a, a shipping container went lost at sea containing uh, perhaps 18 or 19 tons of uh, the material, that's something that has to be added uh, in the registration. Suppliers for in vitro diagnostic devices will also have to uh, make up some or uh, uh, give some instructions for use and disposal, explaining to professional users and general public how to prevent release of synthetic polymer, particle, polymer particles in the environment. This can also be through the safety data sheet or through label or leaflet. And beyond, there isn't enough uh, place on the timeline to, uh, uh, to note all the uh, specifics uh, for the next couple of years. 
but uh, I try to summarize it as this. Uh, in the next four to 12 years, certain cosmetic products uh, will no longer be available uh, to the market. And in eight years, the granular infill for use on synthetic sports surfaces uh, will also have to uh, uh, cease sales on the market. Now, why is this uh, in the span of uh, four to 12 years or eight years? Well, that is for all the, the products that are in the, uh, in the market right now, uh, that uh, we don't start generating additional waste in a very short period of time. Uh, but that these uh, products can actually maintain their uh, their life cycle uh, and be uh, uh, be removed from the market uh, on a more gradual basis. Now, remarks and thoughts. The first one is: please keep in mind that the regulation started uh, October seventeenth of twenty twenty three. This means. It doesn't apply to products that are, uh, were already on the market before that date. Also, every plastic is a polymer, but not every polymer is a plastic or a microplastic. Read the regulation. Uh, try and see where your product falls and um, check whether or not um, you will be uh, subjected to this regulation. Um, we can always uh, help you figuring uh, things out if, uh, if that's needed. One other thing is guidance. Things we hear from the industries is that uh, there's a lack of guidance, a lack of a guideline. Uh, for instance, uh, similar to the one uh, used for CLP. Um, so I'm uh, very curious to see how this will uh, evolve in the coming time. We'll keep an eye on this legislation, all the changes that might be coming. If there's any news on any of these uh, items uh, on this topic, we'll let you know. Now, questions, uh, as this is a pre-recorded uh, webinar, <laughs> that's a bit difficult, but uh, you can call or mail us, uh, just contact us. Uh, every company is different. Uh, there are always specific issues or specific cases. Just let us know, uh, we can run it by, uh, by you. Um, also, there's a possibility just for a consultation through a meeting or an online meeting. Um, you can see uh, all our uh, data here. You can uh, contact us through the VB Fabrik or SDS Factory uh, or by the uh, phone number that you see right here. That concludes the webinar. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope it has been uh, useful or uh, interesting enough to follow. And uh, I'll see you another time. Thank you.